new technology, new technology with the application of autonomous vehicles. So I will give a brief introduction to trustworthy AI, just in a very high level, why we care about it, what is it, right? So then uh, my student Wen Hao will actually dive into one of the specific topic about scenario generation. So this is a kind of, uh, uh, I think we are trying to fill in a, a, a gap that between our theoretical work into the real world application that all the companies right now are working on. So uh, let's start this journey. So why we care about this? Why now? Uh, because basically, I, in my opinion, we, we are on the cusp to revolute the way to make machines. So uh, here I use three uh, pay, uh, articles from Science Journal uh, to introduce this. So first is the, I, I would say connection. So in the traditional way, uh, oh, sorry. In the, can you see my mouse? Uh, so, uh, on the screen, okay. Yeah, in the traditional way, we are using this so-called way process. Uh, so we define, we have a concept of subsystems, right? So we define the overall criteria, then we have a requirement for uh, the subsystem, I have architecture when we do the design for each subsystem, we do the verification, validation, and test. This is what we designed the machine previously. So now, thanks to all the, you know, the, the big data, and also the uh, more and more advanced uh, sensors uh, and the computational devices. Now we can develop very large uh, neural network that almost can um, try to replicate the capability of a human being's brain. So, so connection, uh, like all connected, the, the algorithm is connected. It's, it's very, this kind of algorithm is very different from the traditional ones that has the system and, uh, and subsystems. The second is change is the algorithm is actually evolving. That thanks to the um, reinforcement learning. So this is the paper that published on science. Um, so you introduce algorithm that can actually place three different kinds of chances. Well, traditionally we have this uh, waterfall model that we inherited from CS. It's called waterfall model is because when you have the design or you have the implementation the verification, it just go down. It will now it will now go back. Right, so that's called, it's called waterfall. Once you go down, you will not come back. But the nature of reinforcement learning is actually evolving, right? So you are trying to search driven by the environment feedback and you also your reward. So it's kind of a self-supervised uh, approach. So it's, it's quite different from the waterfall model. And then finally, uh, we have, this is a, a era of big data. So all the data we collect in the last two years is more than what we have before two, year, two years ago. So we have such a like exponential, in other words, we have exponential growth of the data and the comparison between the closed uh, source. And also another uh, trend is we have the data is open source and also the tools to process the data is also open source. So we have this uh, sharing community or culture that actually can make the way to make machines quite revolutionary right now. So, um, and then because of all those changes, we now we have a lot of very cool applications, self-driving car, you know, robot in the healthcare system, the deliver drones, uh, this uh, like a robot can answer your questions and uh, play with the keys, uh, working in a, a warehouse, household robot, assistant robot, and the robot for manufacturing. Right? So all those new robots, that is a cyber physical system, can enable a lot of new applications because of the change of the technology. So then it comes to the, um, basically the concept of trustworthy AI. So this, is a, this was published a, a few months ago, two or three months ago. This is called Trustworthy Autonomous Vehicle, published by U, uh, European Union. Um, so here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, report, they define um, what is a trustworthy AI. Uh, and also they have, a, I think in the Europe, they have a very interesting um, umbrella that can uh, invite all the uh, scholars um, and to think about what's the fundamental problem and work on those together. So one of their output is, is this document on trustworthy AI uh, or trustworthy autonomous vehicle. So uh, they say trustworthy system, AI systems 
are human centric and rest on the commitment to their usage in the service of humanity and the common goods with the goal to improve human welfare and freedom um, is conceived, it, it is conceived and mean to maximize the benefit of AI while at the same time preventing and minimizing their risks. So they, this is like a seven, uh, 70 OT pages report. They have very specific detail about how to uh, define what is a trustworthy AI in different, I think seven categories. At each category, they have a lot of subcategories. So to define this, like safety, robustness, generalization, certification, accountability, so all of this. So I suggest if you're interested in cars, uh, in autos vehicles, this is something you, 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 I, I think you will want to read. Okay, and who, who, who else cares, right? So uh, I think almost everybody cares. For example, in Google, they have DeepMind, they have this uh, AI safety center. Uh, IBM had this trusting AI. Microsoft research, they have trustworthy AI and OpenAI has um, this uh, uh, safe artificial intelligence. Um, at SMU, we also have the initiative called Responsible AI. I think there's a different names, but I think all of them want to build this co cohort of trustworthy AI. Not only in the industry, but also in the government, for example, NSF, they have launched the two national AI center for trustworthy AI. Uh, this uh, uh, Penn also have this uh, center for AI and uh, uh, Professor Rohu uh, uh, Magram so also has this, uh, you know, it, this is his lab play a very core uh, role in this effort. Uh, and Stanford has this AI safety center uh, and also some NGOs, they also have this, you know, uh, focus on this topic. So this is a called Future of Life, this NGO uh, launched by uh, Elon Musk and also uh, uh, some other uh, billionaires. Okay, so in our lab, we focus on two topics. One is uh, uh, mobility. Um, so uh, it's uh, uh, autonomous vehicle is one application. We also work on this delivery robots. And here is what our lab introduced our delivery robot to four senators uh, you know, uh, last year. So on the, on the right, we also apply this to uh, healthcare uh, systems. So we want to uh, make a, it's an agent study, right? So we hope the robot can take care of the, um, the, uh, the, the old people. So that we also need to make sure that the interaction between human and machine is, is secure, is, is safe. And also we want to use for diagnosis of some uh, disease to reduce the cost of the healthcare and uh, uh, also increase the, uh, the accuracy. Okay. Oops. Um, so uh, the mission of our lives is that we want to develop this trustworthy AI and we define that in the six, six different categories, robustness, safe, generalizable, both explainable, certifiable, and human-centric in the face of uncertainty, dynamic, multi-agent, and human-involved environment, by bridging rigorous theories and the practical technologies. So particularly, uh, I put these things into this uh, three, cat three different circles. Uh, this is uh, directly inherited from uh, the structure of MDP. Uh, you, know, you have this transition probability, P, with a uh, given the current state act, act, action, you have the next state. And also you have the state of the policy. So that's your decision uh, making, decision maker. And finally, you need someone to tell what you want, right? So you need a human to tell you what you want and how to evaluate this. So we have the reward. So based on this, so when we model the environment, when we study the environment, we can study the, general, the generalization problem. Basically we want to work not only in the data we collected and played back, we also want, want the algorithm be able to generalize. And also we want the agent to be robust, right? So with the, against the noise. And if you know the uh, preference and you also know the, your uh, environment and your uh, agent, you want to place, you want to explore things safely. So sa safe, safety is actually in the middle between, it's related to both the environment and agent. And we, I, I, I think these three features are the intrinsic feature of the trustworthy AI. And the extrinsic features are 
uh, certification. We want to know how and whether, how, how easy we can certify an algorithm. We want the algorithm to be explainable. And finally, this algorithm should be human-centric, meaning we need to consider, for example, fairness and privacy of those data of this uh, algorithm when we, when we created them. So if we, I think if we can do both the intrinsic and extrinsic, then we have a good sense of uh, trustworthy AI in general. So in today's talk, we are mainly focused on in, in the evaluation and the certification, and particularly how this can incorporate of some our human preferences, and also uh, how we can model the environment, the real world environment based on from the data and our social rules. So that's uh, I will, from here. I will turn to. Uh, Wen Hao uh, about this uh, uh, this uh, cohort this a uh, whole big topic about scenario generation. So I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank, uh, I will share my screen. Okay. Um. And it's a great honor for me to talk about my previous research here with you guys. Um. My name is Wen Hao Ding. I'm a third year PhD student at Professor uh, Giles Lab. And uh, today the topic of my presentation is about safety critical driving scenario generation and also um, lessons we have learned from previous uh, works, previous algorithms. Okay, let's start. So the first question is why we care about the safety critical scenarios. Uh, this is a figure from the California Department of Motor Vehicle Disengagement Report. As two years ago, and uh, the y-axis represent the males per disengagement for the autonomous vehicles. So we can see there are already some companies like Waymo, Cruise, they achieve very good performance in this uh, report. It seems they can't uh, drive a, lot, a lot, very long uh, journey without uh, any take, uh, takeover. That's a great um, success. But then we want to ask a question, is this safe enough? So we know that they can achieve this uh, agree, uh, agreed achievement, but we know that we also know that there, there are two types of scenarios in the real world. One we call it uh, typical scenarios that could happen in the normal life, and uh, there are a lot of such scenarios in the uh, normal traffic conditions. But also we found that there are some safety critical scenarios, which is very rare and also important. Sometimes of these scenarios can cause very huge damage to human and the properties. So that's why we want to focus on this part, how to generate the safety critical scenarios and then use these scenarios to evaluate or to develop development the autonomous vehicles, not just under, to, uh, take, to evaluate them, not just under the typical scenarios, but also uh, under such very rare but important scenarios. And then I can share what's the topic I will introduce today, uh, three things we, we care about. The first one is, as I, share, as I shared previously, this figure. So we want to uh, investigate the safety critical scenarios. So we want to first define what is safety critical scenarios, and then we want to uh, investigate why these safety critical scenarios are rare. And then the, first, uh, the second part will be about, um, about this gap. Is, um, it, for human drivers, actually, we know that sometimes, most of times there are some drivers that have very low skill, but also sometimes people have high skill driving uh, driving skill. And in average, there, is, there should be a normal distribution like this. So this represents the human drivers. And for the autonomous vehicle, we expect that it should have a better performance, average better performance than the average um, uh, human drivers. But uh, we know that there is a gap here and how to evaluate this gap and how large is this, uh, is this gap. That's the thing that we want to uh, evaluate after we having both the typical scenarios and the safety critical scenarios. Okay, the last part is, uh, is actually very important about the, today's topic is how we can generate those scenarios. We have a lot of different methods. Here I, I gave three types of examples presenting three different types. First one is, is this one, it's called random simulation. We, can, we, we already have a lot of traffic simulations in, in uh, like companies and the research lab. We all have these simulations, but we can, most time we only do random simulation to, uh, to evaluate the autonomous vehicles. And in this case, it actually is not, uh, the fidelity is not high and also it's, we cannot generate a lot of uh, risk scenarios. And another thing, uh, we can do is for the, for the, is the open road test, uh, which means we can directly drive our autonomous vehicle in the road to test uh, 
uh, what will happen. But in this case, it's very uh, realistic. But uh, the thing is, we cannot intentionally create a lot of risk scenarios. That's the problem. And uh, another perspective is we can do this adversary uh, attack, which is also a very large field in the um, learning or in the robustness of the community. They want to specifically design some attack to the autonomous, autonomous driving system to generate such risk scenarios. Uh, but in that case, uh, we, we can definitely create a lot of risk things. But the problem is, we still don't. don't it's still, they are, most of them are not realistic because they are uh, designed for uh, uh, optimized by some uh, objectives that well, we want to uh, attack the autonomous vehicle. But most of them will not happen in the real world. So that's actually the uh, most important part in my today's talk is how to generate those scenarios and what we should consider during this generation. Okay, so let's go to the next part. Uh, let's have some de definition about the safety critical scenarios. So firstly, what's the driving scenarios? Uh, in, this, in this talk, I actually uh, formulate this scenario, driving scenarios with two, with, with, sorry, with three components. The first one is called S, it represents the static environment, uh, like the road shape and some traffic signs, traffic lights, something that is static in the scenarios. And the second part is about the initial condition and the initial properties of the object. Uh, for example, the color or the shape, the size of the vehicles uh, uh, or other traffic participants. Yeah, that's the, for the initial conditions. And the third one is very important. It's called the sequential behaviors of the dynamic objects. So here I use the trajectory to represent, represent those sequential behaviors. This is very important because a, a scenario is complex because there are very complicated interaction and behaviors of all these traffic participants. And that's the thing that caused risks uh, in, in, the, in the real world. So that's the thing that we care, that we care about. Okay, um, have, after having this driving scenario definition, we will also have our safety critical scenario generation. And here we assume that there are two things that are important. First one is we assume there we have a function fx to measure the safety level for a specific scenario x as we defined here. And then we'll also have a distribution of the scenarios. The distribution is parameterized by theta. So the basically our objective function is to maximize the expectation of this one. We sample from the distribution of the to maximize the, uh, uh, to maximize the, 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 the uh, mirror function here, which represents the safety. And then our parameters, the, param the parameters we, we want to modify is the distribution, the parameter representing the distribution. Yeah, that's a very general representation of the safety critical scenarios. But for different algorithms, actually, they have, they have very different uh, formulation of this problem. Uh, we will see in the next several slides. Okay, um, yeah, then let's go to the next question. Why not trivial? So why this problem uh, is worth doing is uh, actually we have some very intuition, intuitive thoughts like we can directly collect from real world data. Uh, but I, I, as I said, it's tr tremendously rare. The critical scenarios are tremendously rare, and it's also expensive to intentionally create such crashes or collisions. That's like one problem. And also in the simulation, it's uh, definitely a very uh, good choice to run something in the simulation. But uh, in current rule-based simulations, there are two big, two big problems is uh, the lack of diversity. So we already uh, have only have some predefined rules, but we cannot explore other things uh, besides these rules. And the second one is it's not realistic to uh, uh, both the fidelity of the image and uh, the smoothness of the trajectory or something else. Sometimes it's not realistic uh, when we do things in relation. So that's the thing I actually I want to say that this problem is not trivial. And uh, in current time, actually, it's a good time to. To, to investigate this problem because we have a lot of tools in machine learning in optimization. So we can definitely find a lot of combinations of existing tools to solve this problem. That's actually the thing that I want to discuss today. So firstly, let's uh, have a look at what's, how to uh, categorize, categorize existing algorithms. So this, is a, this figure is from a recent survey uh, we published. 
Actually, we want to divide the statistically critical scenario generation algorithm into three parts. And our categorization actually comes from the, it's according to the information source. We know that we already have a lot of data in the real world. And also we briefly talk about the adversary generation, which we, where we, uh, we, uh, we call it adversarial here. And the last one is called knowledge. So because the traffic scenarios are something happening in the real world is related to human life. So our human will definitely have a lot of knowledge, prior knowledge about this, uh, what is risk and uh, why should we care about it. So we definitely have this kind of knowledge. So that's why we divide the existing algorithms into these parts, uh, data-driven generation and adversity generation, and also last one, knowledge-based generation. Okay, um, now let's look at the first one. Um, it's called uh, database generation. So in this figure, we have two passes to do this, to generate scenarios. One is we can do direct sampling. Uh, where uh, it's, it's this loop, uh, this pass. And in this method, we can directly um, sample from the data log collected from the real world. Uh, we can also do some simple uh, perturbation to the, to the parameters like the uh, some positions of the pedestrians, some parameters like that. And then after that, we can generate a lot of uh, scenarios. The second type is after we're having the data, we can use some density estimation methods like uh, deep genetic models. It's very popular in recent years, like uh, GAN and VAE. So we can learn a density estimation model to, um, to learn the distribution of the data. And then we can sample from the distribution to get something new that we have never seen in the real world data set. That's basically two uh, categories uh, belong to the database generation. And then we can talk about this second one is called adversary scenario generation. So the main difference between this one and previous one is that we put an autonomous vehicle in the loop, which is this. So uh, after putting our autonomous vehicle algorithm in, in the loop, we can actually uh, build a formulation about, about the, the so the target is to minimize the performance of the autonomous vehicle. And then it forms a loop to, for, for the adversary attack. So we can generate something and then we can check around this scenario in the simulation and then check whether it is risk. If, it, if it's indeed risk, then we can update the parameters of our generative model to see we can uh, modify the parameters according to either the gradient or some other information to improve the generated scenario. Then uh, re after repeating this, this loop a lot of times, we can finally get a distribution to represent the risk scenarios. That's uh, for this part. And uh, we, we actually divide this adversary scenario generation into two uh, uh, types. The first one is called static scenario because um, it, it's actually, um, there are a lot of high dimensional data like image and LIDAR is very important for the autonomous vehicle. And that's why a lot of people focus on the computer vision or perception module of the autonomous vehicle system. But in most cases, they talk, we are talking about the image, single image or single frame of LIDAR dimension uh, or LIDAR sensors. So that's why we call it static scenario because it's a single frame and we, we want to only care about the uh, detection, uh, object detection or segmentation performance of these scenarios. So the, the, there are a lot of works about this. So we put it in the static scenario. And another uh, very large field is called dynamic scenario. So that's actually a uh, worry. It's more about the trajectories and the policy, the behavior of the uh, eco vehicles and the surrounding vehicles. So sometimes we will change, we can change the initial condition of all these uh, pedestrians or some surrounding vehicles. And also we can control the entire policy the adversary policy of the surrounding vehicle to uh, be, react with the interact with the eagle vehicle. Then we can generate basically fi finally the, the representation will be a trajectory. It, it actually is very uh, it's a low divisional case uh, compared with the static scenario. Okay, um, then the last one is called knowledge based scenario generation. Uh, this part actually is not as clear as the previous two uh, categorization because the knowledge have a lot of different representation. We can represent as some constraints, we can represent maybe even in some causality uh, that's very different. So here we only represent part of the uh, method. For example, we can, uh, can start from a real world data set, then we can abstract some knowledge from the data set. Then we can use the knowledge to either 
guide the generation mode, generative model to do this generation, or we can also use it as constraint to do the uh, constraint optimization to generate the risk scenarios. So these are two, uh, I think, very important paths uh, for the generation uh, using the uh, prior knowledge. Yeah, so I will, basically we still have uh, two types. One is called predefined rules. So we uh, you can use it for some image or LIDAR generation. I will talk about some specific uh, algorithms later. And also we have this knowledge gap learning is basically about the uh, constraint optimization and even causality during this learning. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, I think that's all three types. I think you will be familiar with these three types after my uh, brief introduction. Then we can look at some specific works that uh, represent those particular works. I just, want to, I just want to pause for a moment to see if there are any questions. Oh, sure. Any questions on it? Pretty high level, but uh, from what I know in the past, you know, five years in, in Zooks and Waymo, there have been like uh, an NVIDIA, there have been like crazy amount of investment just in this kind of infrastructure for testing. How do you generate the scenario? How do you can you replay a drive, but actually introduce new agents or delete certain cars from that drive and then retrain on that? Um, or can you uh, actually now? Uh, I, I remember we had Rackwell Saskatoon from uh, Zoom, uh, from uh, Uber ATG where she was uh, heading the lab in Toronto coming last year, and she spoke to us about how they they have miles and miles of drives, and then they can automatically uh, remove certain cars and introduce other agents within the replay, and they, so they can have more adversarial play. The NVIDIA guys had a way to replay the same simulation, but you could actually uh, change the, because when you update your controller, you may not drive on the same trajectory as when you drove the first time. So how do you make an open loop scenario into a closed loop scenario, where you can they automatically generate scenes that are out of the perspective or in the peripheral view. So if you're going even 15 degrees off track from the original, um, then they can capture that. And then they and then the same thing with the Waymo guys, they do like these nightly runs where they update the code and they run it across like you know another hundred thousand miles overnight. And then they check the code, they get the results in the code. So this is like a huge, huge problem. And uh, there's a lot of recruitment in this area. Yeah. Any so any questions so far? Okay, all right. Continue, please. Thank you. Okay, I think you. we have a question from online audience. Oh, great. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, in the adversarial uh, scenario generation, so there's a sentence called the minimize uh, ABS performance. So can you be more specific on that sentence? So what's the specific meaning of minimized autonomous vehicles performance? Yeah, yeah. Here, um, it's uh, actually... Uh, it includes a lot of different metrics. For example, you can the the, the most intuitive, intuitive metric is the distance between the ego vehicle and the other vehicle. If we ignore the velocity, so basically the uh, the target of the ego vehicle is to avoid collision. So it want to maximize the distance or control the distance in, in, inside of a region, and that's the uh, target of the autonomous vehicle. And in the opposite direction, in our generated the target of our generation model is to minimize this distance, which means we want to make the collision between the ego vehicle and other vehicles. That's one uh, metric that can represent this performance. And the other things like if we focus on the perception module, we're talking about the uh, object detection accuracy and the segmentation accuracy. So the performance here means the accuracy. We want to mi minimize the accuracy in, in opposite to the original target of the algorithm. Yeah, that's two examples. Uh, thank you, thank you for the, good. thank you for the yes, clarification. I, yeah, I think Wenhao will dive into each of these three category uh, now, so you will see more examples. Yeah, thanks for the clarification question. I will uh, try to provide provide more details about those algorithms. Okay, um, I start about the specific algorithm. The first one is uh, is from Wimo actually. It's a very I think it's the largest company in the. Uh, company uh, in, in this uh, in this field. 
And then there actually their system is very, it's not very complicated. But I think it's very useful according to this direct sampling. They actually uh, collect a lot of data about the uh, fatal collisions and they, they use this clear reconstruction module to try to re re reproduce all these things in the simulation. And then they can have the uh, different parties of this collision and then they can actually, what they do is they synthetically replace the human-driven human, uh, driven crash participants uh, with the remote driver. So they know that, basically they know that there is a collision happen between all these participants and then they replace this one of the participants with their driver to see if they can uh, avoid this collision. That's a very intuitive way, but I think it's also uh, very important because they, they're, these collisions are very uh, realistic because they, they are collected in the real world. Yeah, that's one thing from the, the company. And the next thing I, we're going to talk about is the density estimation. So here we know that we are talking about the, the scenarios and the scenarios we already have a very good structure like this one. We have a sin tree or sin graph. Uh, maybe some, some of you are familiar with the a game, you, you are familiar with this thing graph. So you are in the game, we have a graph to, rev, to control all the actors and uh, agents in, in the game. So this is actually very similar. So we have a uh, real world data and like this one is a front view image and we have a lot of vehicles in the image. So then we can try to learn a tree to represent the relationship between all these objects. Uh, we can start from a road and a lane and finally we have cars uh, persons and trees, then we can use some uh, renderer uh, or some game engine to render the image according to the uh, scene tree. So we can finally have something like this. That's actually a, also a front view image of a scene or a, a scenario. Then we can try to modify the tree structure uh, according to either the optimization method or by, or by some pretty different rules. Then we can modify the general scenario. Then we can Try to generate something that is risk and also it's not it's unseen in the real world. Yeah, that's one algorithm from the density estimation because we're trying to learn such a the distribution of such a, a tree tree structure. Okay. Uh, next one is also from the density estimation. We know that we are uh, the you know the scenario actually are dynamic. We have trajectories not instead of just the image. So there are also works trying to autogressively generate the vehicles and also the trajectories. So in this paper, they, they divide the generation into two stages. The first one is they autogressively generate the, the vehicles. So at the beginning, we have some, we have a map and we have a, a eagle vehicle here. And then we use the neural network model to generate one surrounding vehicle, which is this green one. And then we input the generated scenario in, again into the model to try to generate the next vehicle. And after repeating this process a lot of times, we have the entire scenario, but all of these vehicles actually, uh, if we finish the generation here, so all of them are static. So we need to consider the generation of the trajectory. So that's why they also put another model inside of this, this stage, they call it a STM, And then they can generate the class of the vehicle, the position of the vehicle, and also finally the velocity of the vehicle. So they generate a lot of things about it. Finally, we can um, create uh, the trajectory of the vehicle. And finally, we have the entire uh, scenario. So examples are like this. We have the entire scenario. We have, at the beginning, we only have a map and then we have this eagle vehicle. And after the generation, we can have a lot of behaviors of other vehicles. So in this way, we can simulate the real world uh, traffic scenario. And also the learning is from data. We use the real world data to do the learning. So the distribution will also be similar to the real world um, scenario. Yeah, that's another example. And uh, okay, that's for the data-driven method. And then we can go to the uh, second part is about the adversary generation uh, algorithms. Then uh, firstly, we start from the static scenario, which uh, here is uh, a very interesting example. So I assume that we have a, a autonomous vehicle or other vehicle, uh, sorry, this, this one should not be another vehicle. It's uh, another vehicle on the road. And we have some LIDAR, uh, cloud from the lighter. So uh, if the detection algorithm works well, it will give us a bunny box, a 3D bunny box of the other vehicle. But here, if we put a, a very strange object on top of the vehicle, then the LiDAR, we, we got it, we get it something like this. And in that case, we want to uh, attack the detection algorithm. So the detection algorithm will fail to detect such a, a vehicle and it will 
then it's very risky because the eco vehicle will ignore this one. It just thinks maybe this just, it's just a, uh, it, there is no vehicle here, and we just uh, drive on into this direction, and there could be some collision happening. Yeah, that's the motivation of this paper. And uh, the pipeline they use actually is uh, it is also interesting. They try to include the differentiable renderer in, inside of the loop. Uh, they build a differentiable LiDAR to simulate the uh, recasting process of the uh, of the light. So they can start from this adversary mesh and then they can project the shape of the mesh uh, into the uh, uh, into this point cloud. So they can get the, the points representing the uh, representing this uh, adversary mesh and then they can put it on top of the vehicle. So finally, at the beginning, they have a uh, seeing uh, let us say like this. Sorry, and uh, after the adding this object, they get some. They get something like this. It's a, 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 a new one, a new object on top of the week. And then they can use any uh, detection algorithm here, and then they can get detection results. And their uh, objective is to minimize the this detection score. So that's one example I just uh, said. We can use the this detection score as a matrix. Then the algorithm. The target of, of our algorithm is to minimize the score. So finally, we want to get something like this to make the algorithm fail. And then it's very risk for the bottom vehicle, especially the precision system. Yeah, here I mentioned it's a, called a white box attack because here we have a differentiable render and we also know that we can access the gradient, the, the internal message from the detection network. So that's why we call it a black box attack because they can directly use the gradient from uh, backpropagation from this part finally to the to the shape of the, the this mesh. So they, it's very efficient to optimize the, uh, the the mesh, the shape of the mesh to achieve their goal. Okay, this actually is a, the entire pipeline is very interesting and uh, similarly in the in the image area, we also have, we can also do some similar things. Uh, for, for example, at the beginning, we have an image like this. There are two vehicles and they, they are all detected by the algorithm. But then we want to generate something like this. We change the color of one vehicle and we call it a tag image because we change something in the image. And then the algorithm will to detect this, this vehicle. It can only detect the, the front vehicle. So it's similar. It has a very similar structure as the previous one, but just this just this time it works on the image area. And uh, in, that, in this case, we don't only care about the specific object, we care about all the conditions or parameters in the scenario, like, like the lightning and the, the post of all, all other vehicles, and even the materials, materials including the color, the texture of the vehicles. So we can control a lot of different parameters and then input them into the differentiable renderer. And then we can combine with the background, we can finally uh, generate some uh, scenarios like this represented by the image. And then we can uh, put any, uh, any arbitrary uh, detection model here to get, get, get our label. And then our target is to um, minimize the accuracy. So we, we don't want the algorithm to detect this object. And then we can use this back the, the, the gradient from the back propagation to update all these parameters. And then we can generate something that is very risk for the perception system. Okay, um, there's two works uh, sharing very similar structure. It's um, all about the static scenario, static scenario. And next one, let's look at something about the dynamic scenario. So in this case, we don't only care about the front wheel image, but we care about trajectories. We assume that autonomous, autonomous vehicle ha could have a left turn or right turn in this intersection scenario. And then there is another object called the cyclist. So the cyclist can start from here, from here, or here, here. They ha it, has, uh, it has actually foremost of the distribution. We can regard this as a, maybe a foremost uh, Gaussian mixture model. And then we can actually create some uh, risk scenarios by uh, optimizing the, the initial position and the velocity of the uh, cyclist to, to try to have a collision with the autonomous vehicle. We want to test if the autonomous vehicle can um, can break or can or decelerate after it has some potential to have this clear. So that's one way to generate the risk scenario for this dynamic things. Okay, um, so there are two uh, example results here. This is what we learned from our distribution. We try to model the distribution of the of the initial position and 
uh, here I call it initial conditions, it's including the uh, initial position and the initial uh, orientation of the cyclist. So these points, basically they are four dimensional points and they represent the angle and also the, the velocity. So uh, for example, if the uh, vehicle have a left turn here, so we can generate some cyclist they start from here and its orientation is this direction. And then it has a potential to uh, to have a collision with uh, cause some collision for the ego vehicle. So we can see whether the, uh, the ego vehicle can deal with this uh, risk situation. Yeah, this one is another case. We have a right turn uh, route and the algorithm, the distribution is a conditional distribution. So it will change the samples and uh, according to the behavior of the ego vehicle. Okay, um, here is some videos. One video shows the generated scenarios. This pink box represents the cyclist and our ego vehicle is this green one. If it perform a left turn, we will, after the optimization, we can see that we generate some uh, the risk, uh, the, sorry, the cyclist and we'll have a collision with the uh, autonomous vehicle. Yeah, here every time it has a clearing because the ego vehicle we use is not a very smart system. So we just want to show that it has the potential to have clearing. But if it's a smart enough uh, autonomous system, it actually, in most time, it will avoid such clearings. Okay. Um, okay, that's one work about the initial condition. And the second work I want to introduce under this advanced generation is is using a multi-agent uh, system. So we know that the ego vehicle and surrounding vehicles, they form a very large uh, multi-agent system or multi-agent framework. So we can definitely use a multi-agent uh, reinforced learning algorithm to solve this problem. So in this paper, they use this multi-agent uh, DDPG algorithm to generate the behavior of the ego vehicle and also other vehicles. So here they call the ego vehicle player and call the other vehicle the non-player characters, so it's NPC. And after this generation, uh, learn, learning of the model, they can try to generate something risk for the player. So here is one example, the NPC rush into the player to have, it could have caused some trouble for the player. And then after running uh, several steps, the player just stopped because it, 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 it caused all the uh, behavior of the NPC. That's one example. And I think very interesting point in this work is, you can definitely create something like this. You can uh, put out uh, any uh, arbitrary vehicle uh, in, in the scenario and use it to try to rush into the uh, ego vehicle. But actually it's not very realistic in the real world because in, in most time in the real world, there will not be any, there will not be such uh, aggressive or, or, with, uh, or drivers that do, do things like this. So actually they want to avoid such, um, such uh, unrealistic things. That, uh, what they do is they add additional uh, reward into the objective. So with the, the NPC here is not just want to cause some trouble to cause the trouble to the ego vehicle, but it also has its own uh, goal positions. It also need to solve solve its own problem, uh, uh, reach the position maybe in, in in the in the future. So that's why they uh, they can it, it itself can balance these two goals. One is go to the Go position and another is uh, have some make some trouble to the uh, player to the ego vehicle and uh, uh, considering these two goals uh, finally they can uh, they can generate something that is both risk and also realistic yeah that's I think is very interesting in this work okay um, yeah that's for the adversary generation part and uh, lastly we can talk about this knowledge based generation uh, firstly introduce is about this role-based general design method. So this uh, 10 scenarios uh, are from the uh, design in this color autonomous driving challenge. They have the artificial design is uh, these uh, 10 scenarios with fixed parameters and also some trigger, posi trigger position or trigger, trigger conditions. So they all fix all these things. And uh, then if the ego vehicle uh, Drive into the drive into one region, and uh, another a pedestrian will show up and try to do something. But that's all based on rules and the fixed uh, uh, at the beginning. So the disadvantage is that it's not it cannot be adapted to uh, different algorithm uh, ego vehicle algorithms. So sometimes it just fails. 
But the advantage is that it's very simple to do such things and it use a lot of human knowledge. So we know that because we, uh, our, our human as a driver, we know what is risk. And so we can definitely reproduce such roads that may cause some risk for the ego vehicle. And because it's very simple, so I think a lot of companies still trying to uh, use some of such things to design the risk in their system. Okay. Um, besides this, directly using this knowledge as rules, there are also other works uh, using the uh, constraint optimization. So this is a very interesting work. It's very recently just published maybe one month ago. So their target is to attack the uh, trajectory prediction algorithm. We know that in the autonomous system, the trajectory prediction is very important because if we want to do the planning, we, we must know what's the uh, what's the future behavior of the other vehicle. So we want to predict the future trajectory, then we can then, then our autonomous vehicle can do some planning according to the behavior of other vehicles. So this part is very important. And in this paper, they want to attack this trajectory prediction algorithm. So if we don't have any attack, given such a history a trajectory, the prediction will be this one. So it's the autonomous, the other vehicle will keep the lane and will not do any lane changing behavior. But if we uh, modify the history like this, and then the prediction algorithm may have some prediction like this. So it's like a left lane changing to the left lane. And then the autonomous vehicle will take some uh, action to, re to react with this uh, lane changing behavior. That's actually not what we want because in the future, it is not the really real case. It, the other vehicle will still keep, keep driving on the same lane. That's the way one thing that they, these people want to do. They want to uh, modify this history trajectory to fill the prediction algorithm. But at the same time, they have some uh, constraints. Here, I represent the constraints as K. Uh, usually, this constraints means the vehicle dynamics. So this history cannot be unrealistic. It cannot be achieved by any vehicle dynamics. That's one very important constraint. And also, the, the, we can add uh, other constraints according to our prior knowledge. In that case, it's basically a constraint optimization. So we can solve this optimization, and finally, we can modify the trajectory and uh, to fill the uh, trajectory prediction algorithm. Yeah, one uh, example is here. Uh, where is, I show the uh, results before attack, after attack, and after defense. Here, one interesting thing is this defense. So we know that we can use this algorithm to attack the trajectory prediction model. But what's next? Can we use the attack the algorithm to retrain our prediction model? If we can uh, use the attack the, uh, attack the sample to retrain our algorithm, we can maybe we can defense this attack and finally we are still robust enough. This actually is a very large field called adversary training and the defense. So it's also uh, one interesting way to use the generative scenario to make the algorithm robust. So here is one example of these three um, types. Uh, before the attack, all things are well. At the original, the prediction is this three, this, all these three uh, dots are the prediction and seems uh, works well. Uh, similar to the ground truth, the ground truth is the black one. And then after the attack, some of the prediction is not similar to the ground truth. It's like have a left turn, a left uh, land changing behavior. That's after the attack. And after the defense, which means we retrain the model with all these potential risk scenarios, it still have a uh, very good performance, but not maybe not uh, as good as the previous, the original one, but still a little better than the uh, attack one. So it still have a, a good uh, predictive prediction results. That's uh, one, another way of using this, um, con using this knowledge as constraints and uh, then convert this entire problem into this uh, constraint optimization. It's a very large area. Yeah, and the last I just one want is, to pause. I just want to pause for a second to see if there are any questions. Any questions on you know, it, it's, it's pretty high level, so ask questions because they're giving you a survey of all these techniques. There's a reason behind some. So, for example, in this case, it's suppose you designed your AV. The question is, under what conditions can we force this AV to get into an accident? where it may be at fault or the other vehicle could be doing something either 
you know unsafe right right the next safe the other vehicle is safe and legal it's following the traffic rules within those constraints can it still force your av to actually make a mistake to, or to to basically have some kind of contact with that, right so so you have to kind of factor all these npcs or non player characters non non ego vehicles other agents <laughs> so it's like actually like a big game but you want to uh, generate this in some methodical manner so so because as you so i just want to have in the back of your mind you know you'll think about what projects you want to do uh, this this safety is one thing there's a number one thing that sells any of these uh, automotive systems in general right so if we don't sort of nail that forget about avs uh, so these are all these sort of so many techniques to try to say okay we have a good enough av okay yeah please continue okay thanks yeah actually uh i just introduce a lot of Technics details about this um, the works. I think yeah, this will be the final one. I will give some summary. Maybe it will give, give some inspiration to you guys. But the, the last the this work was is similar to the uh, constraint optimization, but just we convert the project the constraint into the latent space because we know that this, we have some structure of the scenario. So we maybe we can generate a much more complicated scenario by leveraging this structure. So they use can use a graph structure to represent scenario and then use the autoencoder structure. It's both of them are neural networks. Then we can get a latent space. And in the latent space, we can uh, start from a Gaussian distribution to do the sampling. We can start from one point and then we can search in the latent space with, with some constraints. And then we can still, we can interact with the uh, autonomous vehicle in the simulator to make sure that our the search is the objective of the search is to um, reduce the performance of the uh, of the autonomous vehicle. So here we do this um, optimization with constraints by a similar idea of the uh, of the constraint optimization, but just in the latent space. So assume we have a knowledge set like this, it's representing the constraints, and then we can start. We know we can randomly start from one point, and we can do this optimization search searching the latest space to max maximize the risk, which also means minimize the performance of the of the autonomous vehicle. And then we can re uh, we can project the point to the side according to some knowledge. Here the knowledge could be some constraints like uh, we will like, like the lane direction or the road layout. So we cannot have a lot of constraints like that in the latent space. Then we can do that. And then we can repeat this process. And finally, we can find a point that Simultaneously satisfy the string and also be risk uh, for the autonomous vehicle. Yeah, that's uh, another work. And I'll uh, have a last one. Last one actually is just it's a preliminary work on, on my uh, previous uh, works. It's uh, more, more about the, some um, another perspective of this scenario, uh, a risk scenario. So we want to ask a question what actually makes the scenario risk? It's a very interesting problem because we, as a human, we, we know a lot of prior knowledge, so I can here give share a very uh, simple example. Uh, we have uh, Tom's vehicle A here. It has a view, this orange region. And then we have another one called B vehicle here. And uh, the B existence of B actually block the view of Tom's vehicle. So it cannot see the pedestrian. And uh, after it, it's close enough to the pedestrian, and maybe it's very late for it to, to decelerate. So it will be some occasion. That's the problem. So. Uh, there are a lot of examples like this in the real world, but in this case, which one we think is the cause of the risk? So usually we think that the existence of B actually is the cause because it blocks the, the view of the autonomous vehicle. Even if the autonomous vehicle have a very low speed, there could be some potential of the collision. So if we remove the uh, existence, or existence of object B, in most time it will be safe because the wheel is is clear, so it can uh, run. Uh, the autonomous vehicle can drive in a normal speed. It will not, will not have a collision. So in this case, actually, we we can roughly give, get such a graph to represent the the, the causality between this uh, between these events. So finally, our events is this collision, so this C node, and this collision is caused by the uh, the this this event, which is the wheel or autonomous vehicle is blocked, and also the pedestrian. Uh, uh, have have uh, have the contribute to the collision and also the uh, the finally the 
the, the reason of this A node is because the other vehicle is parking in this place that causes the, the block of the view. So we can roughly get some uh, causality causal graph like this. And if we can represent our human knowledge in such things in this graph structure, then we can also use it to increase the efficiency of the generation. Yeah, that's actually my uh, recent work, but it's still preliminary. So it was only introduced the general idea here. So we can represent the knowledge into this causal graph structure, and then we can use it to uh, input it into our generation uh, by injecting it into the representation of the scenario. Then we can generate some behavior of the surrounding vehicles, and then we can interact with the autonomous vehicle to update our generator. So in this case, uh, what we do is uh, representing the knowledge in this causal graph, so we can try to increase the efficiency because we are, we know that what's the reason cause this risk. So it's intuition is we can increase the efficiency here. Okay, that's finally we go through this uh, existing work, some existing works very quickly. Hope this can give you some inspiration about the algorithms. And then we can finally get some, some summary of this algorithm. So here I try to summarize five challenges of existing algorithms. Uh, we can see some, um, all of them actually focus on very different uh, perspectives. So most, some of them have diversity, but some of them focus on a single, uh, single scenarios. So I try to summarize them into these five aspects. First one is fidelity. So this, uh, this is very uh, easy to understand because we want to make sure that the scenario generated is, is happen in the real world because our final goal is to deploy our autonomous vehicle in the real world. If that's not the case, it's useless for generating such scenarios. Second one is efficiency because I previously assigned the safety critical scenario are very rare. So we want to efficiently generate those scenarios. But uh, that, that's actually what the original goal of, of, of this works. And also we care about the diversity because we know there could be a lot of different uh, risk scenarios in the real world and uh, we cannot just focus on one specific time we want to cover as much as possible that will make our system robust and generalizable yeah the third uh, the first one is called transferability that's actually i didn't mention this a lot in the previous work because previous works that not does not um, did not actually investigate this a lot uh, when we generate one scenario we hope that it is not uh, specifically targeting on one one autonomous vehicle, because sometimes we put an autonomous vehicle in the loop, but in most time we only can only uh, we can only uh, use one or two types, maybe very very specific specific algorithm. But we don't want our scenario only useful for those specific algorithms. We want our scenario to be transfer can be transferred to other cases that can be used for other autonomous vehicles. That's called we call the transferability. And the last one is called the controllability where most of the works actually just randomly generate some adversary scenarios. Uh, they don't care. Uh, sometimes they, they consider the uh, constraints, but usually we also have some conditions. Like we want to directly, we, we want to only test our autonomous vehicle under some specific road layout or under some specific uh, uh, speed limit, some, something like that. So we want to embed these kind of conditions into the generation or, or maybe also some instructions we just want to test the lane changing behavior. So that's when we call it controllability. We want to control the generative model to uh, according to our instructions. So that's the five aspects that I think are very challenged in the existing works. And uh, currently it seems that uh, no, no kind of work can directly solve all these things. So I, br I briefly uh, draw a figure to represent the, uh, the advantage and disadvantage of this three types of work we just uh, reviewed this data-driven, adversary, and knowledge-based. So some of them, like, like the data-driven, they have very high fidelity, but the efficiency is low because most of the scenarios are, are not really, are not uh, risk scenarios. They are very normal scenarios. And uh, the controllability also is low because uh, we, we can only collect a lot of data. It's hard to control this data. But maybe just only, can only what we can do is just do the clustering and the, to classify the existing data. So this not, uh, does not have a very high controllability. Yeah, that's the example. So no method is perfect now, but uh, definitely the combination of existing works or some new directions could be helpful to, um, to, to, to maybe achieve most of these five aspects to improve the five aspects. Yeah, I think 
that could be uh, inspiring to develop the new algorithm uh, considering these five aspects. Okay, uh, this is a very simple discussion about maybe some just examples to help you uh, create something new algorithm. Maybe you can try to combine this data-driven and adversary algorithm. Then you can broadly evaluate the system under diverse uh, say scenarios. And also you can combine the data-driven and knowledge-based algorithm to, uh, if you have specific requirements, like you, have, uh, you want to have a very high controllability. In that case, you can combine these two. And finally, you can combine these two if you have some rules, you already have some rules to design the risk scenario, but you, are, you don't want to have predefined uh, uh, parameters, then you can use the auto generation to automatically learn the parameters of the predefined scenarios. Yeah, those, these three are just examples and very general, but you can try to figure out what's the most important thing in your case and try what, what's the algorithm you want to select uh, for this scenario generation and autonomous system evaluation. Okay, um, yeah, I think finally we got our last part is about future directions. Uh, I think in our lab, actually, we focus on these things. I think maybe in most labs about this robotics, they also try to, the most thing they care about is about this, the interaction between the environment and the robot. And in this survey, actually, or in this talk, I basically I try to introduce something most in, uh, related to this environment part. So I'm trying to introduce some method that can generate some specific environment given some goals, but also there are a lot of other things that we want to care about. Uh, like, like this one, we want to care about the robot part, how to use this scenario. This is uh, a very important problem. So you use this scenario to increase the robustness, the safety, and also the generalization. Uh, I have not talked about a lot of things about this in this survey because it's a very large area. So here I can give several um, uh, fields that related to these things. First one is called the procedure content generation. So in this, during our generation of the scenarios, we can consider the uh, feedback from the robot. So we can gradually generate something that can help the robot to learn. Here the robot could be autonomous driving vehicle, could be other uh, robots like indoor robots. It can gradually learn from these things. It, we cannot directly give, give it a very risk scenario. It cannot solve it and it will keep feeding. That's not what we want. So we can gradually generate something risk and increase the risk level to help it learn, learn, the, learn this situation. That's one area. And another one is called adversary training. So we can uh, simultaneously train this generation model and our robot to increase the robustness uh, of the robot. As I said in one work previously, I called the adversary defense. So basically that's the idea of adversary training. And the next one is called the curriculum learning. Um, it's similar to this procedure generation. So we want to uh, make a curriculum for the robot to learn, not just give it difficult things at the beginning. So it can totally fail. That's what not we want. So we can use this curriculum learning to help uh, improve the robustness. And uh, another very uh, large field is called robust optimization. So it's all about also about how to use those generated scenarios. It's very uh, in this survey, we only care about this part, but definitely the uh, how to use them is important and robust optimization could be one way uh, to consider the distribution of the generative scenarios and then how to use them to help the, uh, improve the robustness. Of the yeah, so on generating scenario actually is the one puzzle of the entire framework. We definitely have a lot of other directions to, to be explored using such uh, generation methods. Uh, the most important is how to use them and how to uh, deal with the interaction between the environment and the robot. Yeah, that's uh, the final um, missing conclusion of all these existing algorithms. And uh, there are two things I want to introduce is about this survey paper. So in this survey paper, also provide some uh, summary of existing data set about scenario. Uh, it's uh, either about the trajectory data set or perception data set. So if you're interested in how people collect scenarios and how represent scenarios, you can check this table to see it's, I think most of them are very popular one and the recent collected published. So if you're interested, you can check them. Um, and also we have uh, summarized uh, simulations, traffic simulations in this area is all of them already widely used in the, uh, in the autonomous driving evaluation uh, platform.
So uh, if you're interested, you can also uh, check it. Yeah, here the map source and can, can customize scenario are important. We think it's very important and also some are realistic, but other, that others do not care about the, realistic, the reality of the scenario. You can ch choose uh, according to your, uh, your requirement. Yeah, finally, that's it. Yeah, that's my presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Reno. It's very interesting. Thank you, Ding. Oh. Velocity and the distance between between the points, uh, which means you, you you just don't need to don't want to have a very sharp curve of the of the history directories. Uh, okay. uh, at least in this paper, they don't consider very specific dynamics 